Hi, I'm Hayden Dykeman, and this is my talk on the physics of injected insulin, why a low carb works for the type 1 diabetic. So in this talk, um, I will provide insight as to why diets containing rapid acting carbohydrate result in elevated and unstable blood sugars. We will also explain why low carb diets can generate normal blood glucose. The proofs shed light on the importance of understanding the physics of injected insulin. These physics are poorly understood in the diabetes community and my goal is a clear explanation of why current high carb protocols fail. So for my outline, we're going to be covering uh, the introduction of our topic, then I'm going to be moving on to who am I personally, and then we'll be covering traditional method of type 1 diabetic treatment and its total failure. Why does low carb work in type 1 diabetics? Dr. Bernstein's strategy on, and the law of small numbers. Then we're gonna do some details about low carb food, testing Dr. Bernstein's strategy in the real world, the mathematical predictive model of injected insulin, and finally simulation runs and conclusion. My project goal is to develop a computer model that computes blood glucose levels in people with type one diabetes following low carb and high carb diets. More specifically, the project goals are understanding of Dr. Bernstein's law of small numbers, understanding of different characteristics of blood glucose, e.g. hypoglycemia, the understanding of capability of the automated, automated pancreas to generate normal blood sugars when using a low-carb diet, which was first published by my dad in 2014. Next goal is to understand the, blood, the dynamics of blood sugar changes regarding high and low-carb diets. And finally, we have more to come, including AI and machine learning. We will show that normal blood sugars are possible with an automated system. This project is a follow-on to some initial work done by Dr. R.D. Dykeman, who is my dad, in 2013 to understand how to keep my, blood, my brother's blood sugars normal. The results of this were published in a, new, in a now defunct online diabetes magazine, MyGlu, and generated significant controversy. So more about me, I'm a sophomore and very interested in the field of science and medicine. My brother Dave is, somewhat, is a somewhat famous low carb type 1 diabetic and we both work as interns for Dr. Bernstein. I rigorously follow Dr. Bernstein's low carb high protein diet and I've done so for the past 10 years of my life and I'm not type 1 diabetic. I currently play on the Hawaii Junior Olympics water polo team and at the varsity level for my school and we just recently won the state championship. I'm looking for some sport sponsorship or partnership or internship to continue this project for school credit and college application materials. These are two pictures of my older brother and the one on the left is him much younger when he right around the time where he got diabetes and as you can see he has a 4.9 A1C and the older picture of him he has a 4.7 so he's been managing to keep his A1C under 5 for most of his life with type 1 diabetes. And to the right is his CGM log showing a straight 83. Now I'm gonna talk a little bit about the current state of type 1 diabetes care. The current and standard protocol for a type 1 diabetics food management is a high carb and low fat diet. As you can see, boys and girls under five years old are recommended to eat 30 to 45 grams of carb in each meal, while teens are recommended 60 to 75 and 45 to 75 respectively for boys and girls. An example of this menu as we look down are two to three ounces of chicken, one green salad, and one to two tablespoons of dressing, accompanied by a half cup of mashed potatoes, a half cup of canned peaches, and possibly one cup of skim milk. Keep in mind that this is very different from what me and my family eat every meal. Moving on to what we do eat in our family from day to day, Courtesy of Dr. Naiman for this picture of the food pyramid on the left. On the bottom, the most base of everything, we have protein foods, meats, fish, that type of thing. Moving up into the middle section, we have vegetables or greens. And towards the top, we have fats such as cheese and butter and oils. So you may be wondering how these type 1 diabetics are doing following a high carb diet and I can show you that they're not doing very good. Looking at this graph to our left, 
you can see the red line is a graph from about 2010. The blue line is a graph from about 2018. You can see that in adolescents following to their 60s and 70s, both lines are very high in the A1C category. However, the blue line is has a shocking peak above the red line in the age of about 10 to 20 years old. So not only are A1Cs abnormally high, they are also rising recently. The second major outcome from the high carb diet is obesity. As we can see, obesity is at epidemic levels within type 1 diabetics currently. So if you go on social media, what do you see? These two pictures are typical scans of type 1 diabetics who are following a high carb diet out of control and in very high numbers, 346 and 261. So why do these people have such high numbers? The answer is found in Dr. Bernstein's Law of Small Numbers, which generally states that it is impossible to consistently match the action of insulin with food. Now let's hear a perfect explanation of the Law of Small Numbers from Dr. Bernstein himself. If you're on uh, a very high carbohydrate diet, as the professional diabetes associations and endocrine associations recommend, then uh, the logical thing is to take a faster acting insulin. The faster acting insulins uh, are called Novolog and Uvalog. And there's another that's sort of uh, uh, a little bit slower than those called Epidra. Now, in theory, these would work great, but the trouble is that these insulins have a sharp peak and high carbohydrate foods, rapid acting carbohydrates have a sharp peak. And you're expected to match those two peaks in time. A near impossibility. Um, uh, using the term near is even exaggerating because it's a true impossibility because the people who do this never match. They always go too high or too low after meals, and then they go too high or too low later on. Uh, so it's impossible to make this kind of match where you're trying to take two peaks and match them. What we're doing with regular insulin, low carbohydrate and protein, is taking a shallow hill, yes. two shallow hills, like this, and attempting to match them. And if you're a little bit off, you're not going to make a huge mistake. So your timing uh, may be a little off, but you get, uh, if it's off today, tomorrow, you can adjust it by five minutes or so, and that might put you right on because you're just matching up two shallow hills. So let's talk a little bit about Dr. Bernstein's Law of Small Numbers. These two bullet points, I think, summarize them perfectly. The law of small numbers describes the natural variation and therefore uncertainty and inaccuracy that occurs when trying to match a dose of injected insulin with a meal. Big inputs make big mistakes, small inputs make small mistakes. A common question asked amongst type 1 diabetics who follow a high carb diet is, why can't I simply measure out my carbs and perfectly counteract my blood sugar rise every time? The answer for this is found in Dr. Bernstein's Diabetes Solution, where he states that food producers are permitted a margin of error plus or minus 20% in their food labeling of ingredients, as well as the timing of insulin absorption at the site of injection, as well as the rate of digestion can vary from meal to meal and injection to injection. So basically, when counting carbs, someone could be off by a margin of 20% in their food calculation, as well as their injection timing. So in short, consistently predicting and accurately countering a high and fast blood sugar spike from fast acting carbs is virtually impossible due to the high uncertainty in correct carb counting and a person's varying insulin sensitivity. So is there any evidence for the law of small numbers? So the first example is Dr. Bernstein himself. He was diagnosed at, of type 1 diabetes at 12 years old and keep in mind back then there was nowhere near the amount of technology that we have today to deal with it. He's 87 years old now, and he's still doing very good for himself. As you can see in the pictures, he's exercising and he's still practicing medicine. The second proof of the law of small numbers working is a paper published by the Journal of Pediatrics led by a group of Harvard researchers 
focusing on a group of type 1 diabetics who showed unprecedented glycemic control following a low-carb diet. The third example is our theoretical model, which we're talking about here. We model two different but isocaloric meals, a high-carb and a low-carb meal. We model and randomly vary model parameters to simulate natural variation in insulin and meal matching as explained in Dr. Bernstein's book. For example, variation in onset time of meals and insulin, variation in carb macronutrient content in labeled products, and variation in digestion. And then calculate simulated CGM graph outputs. So here are the two meals, a low carb and a high carb meal. The total macros for each are the same amount of calories. However, the low carb meal has four grams of carbs and the high carb meal has 82 grams of carbs. The low carb meal requires three units of humulin R, mostly for protein, and the high carb meal requires 12 units of Novolog, mostly for the carbohydrate intake. So that's our model for food. Now here's our model for insulin action. The insulin action curves for all insulins are published on the internet. These funny curves are well modeled by what is called the Weibull function. The Weibull function has parameters A, B, and P, which can be varied to perfectly match the shapes of the published insulin curves for Novolog, which we use for high carb meals, and regular, which we use for low carb meals. The Weibull model is perfect to understand the law of small numbers. The law of small numbers analysis works by varying variables A, B, P, and T0 in the Weibull function. Varying A would model the lack of precision in food in total dose and total food estimate, for example, total carbs, which would raise the graph up and down. Um, varying T0, which is the meal and insulin onset time, models the inherent variation seen in, one, in onset time of the dose. For example, it would move the insulin timing backwards or the food timing forwards, stuff like that. Varying B and P of the model would shape the insulin dose and food dose and model the variation due to digestion or insulin action throughout the body, which would be more of the shape of the graph. Okay, so how do we calculate the blood glucose level using our models? For calculating the blood glucose level, we use the blood sugar rise rate from food and add it to the blood sugar lowering rate from insulin to compute the blood glucose level. This is very similar to using velocity to compute distance traveled. So again, this is our functional model. We are going to perform a simulation of the law of small numbers for high and low carb meals by randomly varying parameters in the Weibull model within reasonable estimated bounds. First, we could vary time. Varying time is varying the onset of time of the insulin slash food to generate natural mismatch. We model a 20 minute mismatch. This would move the graphs left and right once again. The area under the curve, this represents the misestimation in dose and carb estimation. ARM results model a 20% error due to the food labels being off by plus or minus 20%. Finally, we have the width and shape of the function. Right now, there is no basis for the idea that insulin absorption curve should match the food absorption curve. For example, the food absorption curve could get wider or skinnier depending on how much you chew or even how fast you eat the food. Now we're going to be running the model and seeing the results. Before we start, some comments on our simulation that I have are 50, we, our simulation runs 50 model runs which are plotted for each meal. The model is simple but very well characterizes the experience of a type 1 diabetic. The low carber we can safely start at around 100 milligrams per deciliter or less, but the high carber must elevate their blood sugar to avoid assured severe hypoglycemia. No corrections are given in this initial result, but we can see that with the low carb model, a small correction before the next meal would easily return blood glucose levels to normal. The high carb model, however, would most likely be unable to return to normal by next meal. So these are not the results, I just want to highlight the effects of varying each model parameter individually. Here we are varying onset time and I'll play the video several times for you guys. Now on the left is a low carb and regular insulin, on the right is a high carb and rapid insulin. Play it again. As you can see on the left and the right side, on the top we are moving the time from left to right and that would be adjusting the graph of insulin production. From these bottom graphs, we can see that the low carb blood sugar is 
really only affected in the normal ranges going from about maybe 60 or 70 up and upwards of 110 and the high carb blood sugar is drastically changed from severe hypoglycemia to severe hyperglycemia so that was time now we're going to be looking at when we're only changing the insulin dosing quantity this would be in real life if you were to misestimate the amount of insulin you would need for for food As you can see from the, the top left and the top right, the peaks of the food are going up and up, and the effects it has on the low carb blood sugar are once again very similar to only affecting the time, where the low carb blood sugar is mostly affected in normal ranges, while the high carb blood sugar is affected in severe hypoglycemia, once again going up to severe hyperglycemia later. Our final variable that we're going to be testing individually is the insulin dosing, the shape of the graph mismatching. This can come from, like I said before, the speed someone eats the food or even how they chew the food. So playing the video, we can see on the top, the, the thing being adjusted is the food shape. It's going from this side to this side, being more um, spiky on the right side, obviously. We can see once again the low carb blood sugar is only affected in around the 150 range to about lower than 50 and the high carb blood sugar is a much more um, spiky peak sort of graph while the low carb is very mellow and spread it out easy to correct. So now for the final video, we're going to be randomly varying all three of those parameters at the same time. So this would be more of a real life situation. And as this graph is going, I think it's very telling that you can see such massive clicks and changes going on over here. But if you look at the low carb blood sugar, it's just sort of a line bouncing from once again, normal ranges and very slowly, as you can see, very easy to correct in real life if you were to take this into account. So here's a static plot which shows all of the 50 simulated isocaloric meals shaped into one graph. Um, the low carb model status, or the, sorry, the low carb model results are shown on the left while the high carb model results are shown on the right. As you can see, the low carb starts at about 100, the high carb starts at about above 150, and the low carb model results are very slim and widened, sort of mellow, shallow hills, while the high carb model results are just all over the place. They're going super high up and super low down, or super low down, super high up, and they're ending on all points in the graph around 270-ish to severe hypoglycemia, maybe 50s and below. So now it's for the conclusions of our model. The intake of fast acting carbohydrates must be lowered to generate normal blood glucose levels. Eating high amounts of fast carbs raises the peak height of the, your blood sugar spike and generates instability. As you remember, high, high peaks are super difficult to correct compared to sort of low shallow hills that last a while. <clears throat> low carb allows for relatively easy blood sugar control and normal blood sugars. So we see that by modeling these types of natural variations Dr. Bernstein talks about in his law of small numbers, we end up with a theoretical explanation of why low carb works for type 1 diabetics and why high carb doesn't. Following this, I'm going to give some comments on hypoglycemia implications um, with low carb versus high carb. My brother has never had an episode of severe hypoglycemia and I'm going to be explaining why. So let's start off by reading a quote from Dr. Bernstein. The major reason for the severe hypoglycemia is the high carb diet. If you are going to give a diabetic patient large amounts of carbohydrates and cover it with industrial doses of insulin, you are inevitably going to be causing hypoglycemia and sooner or later severe hypoglycemia. So the answer is a low carbohydrate diet. 
So it's instructive to look at our model in terms of what kind of Dexcom um, CGM arrows you would see when tracking your own blood sugar. So first off, the sideways arrow would be increasing or decreasing less than about one milligram per deciliter each minute. So that would be just a straight line, doing very good. Um, one diagonal would be glucose would increase or decrease about 30 to 60 milligrams per deciliter in 30 minutes. And straight up down, one single arrow would um, mean it would increase and decrease about 60 to 90 milligrams per deciliter in every three, uh, 30 minutes. And double up and double down glucose arrows would increase and decrease more than about 90 milligrams in 30 minutes. Keep in mind that my brother, who's a low carb um, type 1 diabetic, rarely sees the single di diagonal lines on the CGM. He's mostly going straight forward, while I would assume a high carb type 1 diabetic would very often see the straight up and down double arrows or straight up and down single arrows. So here are histogram data from our model runs. Um, as you can see, the single bar on the left side of the low carber would be um, the straight horizontal arrow, meaning that that would be the own, basically the only thing they would see on their CGM, um, absent of diagonal lines, straight down, straight up arrows, and double straight down, straight up arrows. Looking to the right would be the high carbers histogram, and we can see that there is a um, there's a fraction of the time where diagonal and um, straightforward arrows are seen, and also double straight down and straight up arrows are seen. Meaning that if your doctor is prescribing a high carb diet to you, they're mathematically ensuring that you are going to get these complications in your CGM and your blood glucose levels. So my final comments on hypoglycemia are as follows. We're going to start with the fourth one though because that is definitely the most important. The results establish that hypoglycemia definitions require additional definition or context, and that context is rate of blood glucose level change. In other words, a 65 milligrams per deciliter experienced by a low carb type 1 diabetic is profoundly different than a 65 milligrams per deciliter experienced, by, uh, experienced following a high carb diet. This is simply because a 65 milligrams per deciliter experienced by a low carb type 1 diabetic is very slow um, lowering and it's easy to catch. However, a 65 milligrams per deciliter experienced by a high carb diet would be coming straight down almost and very hard to correct as the rate of blood glucose level would be vastly faster than the low carb type 1 diabetic. Starting back at the top, we have the results demonstrate profound difference in rate of change of glucose as a key differentiating feature between high carb versus low carb approach to type 1 diabetes, type 1 diabetes management. The results regarding low blood sugars in the model reflect both the experiences of people with type 1 diabetes who have tried low carb and high carb diets, as well as the findings in the pediatrics paper published by Leonard's et al. for low rates of hypoglycemia. The severe hypoglycemia in people with type 1 diabetes following low carb is rare because there is virtually no time when there is excess unaccounted for insulin on board. That is precisely the law of small numbers. Finally, the model results show that a low blood sugar in a low carber, keep in mind that low blood sugars happen in all people with type 1 diabetes, can easily be treated with a few grams of glucose. The high carb situation may call for dramatic action involving tens of grams or more of glucose, which can then lead to imprecise results and subsequent highs or continued lows. Some future work I have in, in mind for this project are implementing artificial intelligence and machine learning. I also want to know the effect of automated insulin scheduling for high and low carb diets, as well as adding correctional doses into the model. This should be sort of straightforward. My dad did some, some of this work in 2014 and wrote an article in MyGlue which showed normal blood glucose levels are possible with an automated, automated pancreas and low carb. Uh, lastly, I hope to add further real world complexity to our model, which would make it a lot more intricate. Thank you for watching.